finally the Christmas season. A magical time for toy fans. The certainty that Santa would deliver if you were nice was enough to put a smile on your face. But more on the toys you actually got for Christmas in the next episode. Here's a couple toys you wouldn't be able to find wrapped up under the tree on Christmas morning. Maybe Santa's elves just had more demand for Cabbage Patch Kids, so these remain unproduced. After all, it's a wild ride getting toys to shelves, and in this week's episode we take a look at another couple toy concepts struggling to make it into production in time for the holiday season, only to be cancelled along the way. So be sure to subscribe to the channel for more 80s and 90s toy content, deck the halls, and let's strap in for some toy history. Our first story brings us to a galaxy far away where traditions are a bit different and we celebrate Live Day. Nicely documented in 1978's Star Wars Holiday Special, we follow Chewbacca and Han Solo visit the Wookiee's home planet of Kashyyyk to celebrate Live Day, all the while being hunted down by the Empire. You'd get to see all the characters you loved from the first movie in this spin-off. Now even though that sounds pretty good, it wasn't all that great. George Lucas has tried to erase the whole incident from the planet by never ever releasing it again. But hey, for kids, at the end of the 70s, new Star Wars material meant new Star Wars toys, right? You can never have too many Wookiees, that's why Kenner set out to create the whole Chewbacca family that was featured in the special. Itchy, Chewbacca's father, with a little less detail than Chewbacca but added in, was a paint detail with the grey hair making his appearance come across as an elder from the Wookiee species. Mala is Chewbacca's wife and she came in a lighter brown finish. Now both of these were probably just based off of the original Chewbacca. And then there's Lumpy who was apparently created with one of the adventure people figures from Fisher Price. You could find the character called Johnny in one of the wild animal safari sets. The positions of the arms is a pretty good giveaway that it was based off of this figure. Then again a lot of the Star Wars figure molds found their beginnings in the adventure people toy line. Now the toys didn't make it past hard copy stage, so we don't know which accessories they might have come with, but who knows, if they made it into the sequel movies, maybe they would have gained popularity and we could have even gotten a live day playset. Even though the holiday special featured most of the characters we already knew from the movie, it wasn't received well and the sales window was considered too small to create these. Perhaps it would have even been confusing having holiday special cards out. But the special also featured some new characters who would eventually make it into the next movie. Let's not forget that it was the first appearance of Boba Fett. And even after the whole rocket firing incident, he would get a action figure eventually. <laughs> Tying into the movie The Empire Strikes Back. But during the initial appearance, we see Boba Fett riding a sea serpent, and that's one of the other toy concepts Kenner was contemplating on releasing. Here's the sketch made by Tom Troy, who got the job creating designs for vehicle concepts. His assignments included creating some based on the special. After all, the animated parts with Boba Fett seem to have been received as the best part of this TV special. And so he started on Boba Fett's Sea Serpent. Sure, it's only a draw but this could have been a really cool toy. The only extra features it mentions is that the beast would be in Boba Fett's control through a mind harness. Take that Jedi. Seeing how well they did creatures back in the day like the Wampas or Rancor, this would have probably been a highly collectible toy if it had ever been made. Tom Troy did get to see many of his designs turned into actual toys like the Imperial Troop Transporter or the Droid Factory and he would go on to work with many other toy companies. For Mattel, he ended up creating the Mantisaur in the Masters of the Universe toy line. But for real space dinosaurs, it seems like we needed to wait a little while longer. The year was 1988 when Galoop popped onto the scene with a brand new line of space age battling prehistoric giants. Dino Saucers would have been a line of 8 inch action figures based on a syndicated cartoon show, distributed by none other than Coca-Cola Communications. Oh, 
Airing in 1987 and being cancelled after one season, the toy line got quickly cancelled as it could not generate enough support and due to low ratings, there were barely any reruns. Based on the cartoon, you'd be able to get a lineup of four heroic dinosaurs and these would be able to battle four evil Tyrannos. On one side, you had Stego, Bronto, Tunder, Aloe, and Bonehead siding with the humans and their opponents would be Plesio, Quackpot, Ankylo, and the leader Genghis. Rex, packaged in eye-popping blister cards with a space weapon and a full-color optical action lenticular trading card, which was thrown in as well. Of course, these Jurassic Space Explorers needed ships. Each dinosaur got a spaceship, but these were a smaller scale and not compatible with the 8-inch line, so included was one good and one bad 2.5-inch action figure. I guess the tooling needed to create the vehicles for the bigger figures would have been too expensive. Then again, even a playset was designed that could accommodate both the 8 inch and the 2.5 inch line. The Lava Dome base playset with two play levels, 10 play accessories including central viewer screen and movable computer consoles. The set would also disassemble for storage. Now it seems like these toys would never see the light of day and for most of the world they didn't, but there was hope when 1989 rolled around the corner and the series started airing in Brazil. And then toy maker Glasslight ended up buying the molds from Galoop and started producing five of the eight eight inch figures. They are, however, super rare to find. The dinosaurs are leaving, bosses. Luckily, Master Turtle Customs is keeping the line alive by piecing everything together and recreating the molds. If you want to know more about Dinosaucers, I really suggest you check out his Instagram page. And even though the toy line never came to Europe, I did, however, own a VHS tape with these Dinovolving rarities, but I could never find the figures. This is one of those rare instances where the knockoffs are easier to find than the actual toys. Just like with dinosaur bones, you sometimes need an archaeologist for certain toys. When prototypes are found, you need to find the bigger story behind them, like uncovering a fossil and seeing how it pieces together. Oh yeah, we're sticking to dinosaurs. Extreme Dinosaur, starting out as the Dino Avengers in Street Sharks, this spin-off got a Mattel toy line in 1996, followed by a dedicated cartoon a year later. We see the adventures of the Super Warriors as they go up against the evil raptors whose main objective is to cause global warming. After all, these big reptilians would like the Earth's thermostat just a little bit higher for their own comfort. The toy line consisted of many repaints and the introduction of Dino Vision figure variants. But there were also a couple more in the works like this newly sculpted T-Bone of whom two painted hard copies have surfaced. In both examples he would be handling a bar or stick and one has his mouth open, the other one is closed. Painted hard copies are usually a lot more detailed than the production releases, so it's nice to see the teeth and nails popping out of the figure thanks to this paint job. A very hard copy of Bullseye, I believe, was given an amazing paint job. Not only would he have come with an amazing head sculpt, but he would also be wearing a jacket which would have probably been a bendable rubber one. For this Bullseye, they added extra articulation on the wings with extra hands, and there's a button or lever on the back that I guess would activate the horns or missiles on both both sides of the wings. Audacious ingenuity, dude. Would they just pop out a little or be able to shoot out? I unfortunately don't know, but this is one cool looking toy. An unpainted proto of a still unreleased character toy called Rich was also found. So there were probably more figures in the works based on the mysterious humanoid dinosaur that was featured in a couple episodes. Rich fights in an intergalactic fighting arena and is looking pretty badass. Once again, a jacket was added. I guess it gets chilly in outer space unless there's a toad war going on. Just like with Bucky O'Hare. These days, Bucky O'Hare is still an affordable line. Even though the figures often got mixed in with TMNT, they haven't quite captured the rise in value like Toxic Crusaders has in the last couple of years. Too bad the line underperformed because they had already set up not one, but two waves to keep the releases coming. Toad Air Marshals seem to have been overproduced for some reason, so kids couldn't get their hands on Bucky or another character they might have liked. But the second wave would have taken that all away by adding more good 
guys a couple bad toads, and finally Jenny. She was part of the main cast in the cartoon, being the first maid and pilot of the Righteous Indignation. And with superpowers like telepathy, this Aldebaran cat would have been welcome in many toy collections of Bucky fans. Years later, Boss Fight Studios brought some of the Bucky characters back to life in toy form, so she could finally be added to those toy collections. But the vintage version we missed out on would have also been towering over Bucky O'Hare and she would have come with two weapons. A second wave also meant that we needed a variant for our main character. And so Bucky O'Hare with Spacewalk Lifeline came to be. After all, his space adventures wouldn't be the same without his spacesuit. But it wasn't just variants, there was also the good guy cast that got expanded. Rumblebee was a robotic bee and Pit Stuff Beat, a pit bull whom both were a member of Commander Dogstar's crew. Kamikaze Kamo is another four-armed duck, not a dead-eye duck variant, but actually an old friend of him. He runs a ninjutsu school and has two mechanical arms. He would have come with a sword and nunchucks. Now you couldn't have the Toad Wars without the Bad and the Warty. The Toad Army would get expanded with the Total Terror Toad, the axling terror ready to sink its teeth into battle. And then we have Slee Lizard, which is probably my favorite one in the lineup, sharing a color variant of the Kamikaze Kamos sword. He is a member of the Samurai Lizards and an ally of Toad Air Marshal. Now the problem with the production of the first wave is that it came in waves, not providing enough steady sales, leading to its cancellation. The production team, however, was already working on Wave 3. Wave 2 was pretty much ready to go and already announced some more characters that would join the ranks in this epic space battle. Some Hasbro employees even remember the toys lying around at the office on card. So a few production samples are out there and even the carded ones. On the back we could see the names that would follow in Wave 3. For Calvin Lupus Smite we have found a prototype stage toy and for Digger McSquint and Tadbull Tribot there were already sketches made. Comp Complex, the absolute overlord of the Toad Empire, would have made an appearance as well. But how would you bring this 3D polygon image into a toy? Of course, by just doing TMNT's Krang trick and placing him into a mechanical body with a giant collection of weapons attached to it. The design could have hinted a bit to Exo Squad. Maybe it's just time for a Bucky O'Hare reboot, or maybe it's just time to start creating these toys. So, customizers, get on it. Would any of these toy concepts have made it into your Christmas? list. Please leave it in the comments down below and be sure to subscribe for more 80s and 90s toy videos. Don't forget to hit the notification bell and leave a like on the video. If you want to do more you can always check out the Patreon. Special thanks to Chris Fawcett for helping out with this episode. Thank you so much for watching and I hope to see you in the next video. See ya. Bye.